Okay, I think we're we're good to get started. Hello and welcome to the webinar on the SEC changes to the private fund advisor rule. My name is Shauna France and I'm a director of LP Solutions here at Omni. Um, for those who are not familiar, we're a data analytics company that focuses on extracting and structuring legal data from private capital legal agreements. Um, as you may have heard, on Wednesday, August 23rd, the Securities and Exchange Commission released its final rule on the private fund advisors and documentation of registered investment advisor compliance reviews. This final rule is the most significant regulatory overhaul of the private funds industry since the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010. The final rule, absent any potential changes due to litigation, uh, will significantly alter the way that private fund advisors, both registered and unregistered or exempt, uh, investor and investors conduct business. Uh, so here today we have Chris Hayes and Jason Mulvihill, two experts in this field, uh, who are here to help us unpack the rule changes and their impact on the private funds industry. I'll go ahead and introduce you guys. Uh, so let me see here. So uh, Chris Hayes is the president of Redline Strategies, a boutique policy and regulatory advisory firm to private fund advisors and other financial services firms. He has spent over a decade advocating on financial regulation with policymakers in the US, the UK, and Europe, including building and leading the policy and fund terms efforts of the Institutional Limited Partners Association, better known as ILPA, from 2017 to 2022, and working on behalf of middle market uh, GPs, SBICs, and BDCs from 2014 to 2017 at the Small Business Investor Alliance. He currently also serves as an advisor to Omni uh, on our LP products. So thank you for Jason joining us, Chris. Thanks, Sean. Jason Mulvihill is the founder and president of Capital Asset Strategies, which provides strategic advice, guidance, and risk management on complex legal, regulatory, legislative, and transactional issues that confront financial services firms. His career, which began as a lawyer, has spawned both the public and the private sectors, and he has an extensive background leading advocacy efforts for private funds. So thank you for joining, Jason. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, the way this is formatted today, I'll go ahead and uh, click the agenda. We're, we just did our introductions. We'll do a panel discussion. I've put together a list of questions for our panelists as a guide for our discussion, and we'll spend the first 45 minutes going through those questions. Uh, this is meant to be interactive, so if anyone in the audience has questions, please drop them in the Q&A section. Uh, if you see someone ask a question you also want answered, feel free to upvote that question. I'll try to sprinkle the audience questions into the conversation as they come up, uh, but we're also going to leave the last 15 minutes uh, to answer questions from the audience exclusively. Uh, so if there's any anything there, just go ahead and, and put that in. Sound good? All right, and then here's our here's our team of panelists that we're uh, that we're doing. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing for the moment, and we can jump in to the questions. So Chris and Jason, Jason, I um, have a guess at what you guys have been reading for the past week or so. Um, as as we know, the SEC published its proposed rules last year in 2022, and has been receiving comments ever since then. Um, do you know what what was the catalyst for the final rule? Well, I think I'll jump in first. Um, so, so as you mentioned, Shauna worked uh, closely with ILPA on this rule um, for about five years, um, and and I think a lot of what comes out of this rule is really a lot of things that really focus on ILPA's focused agenda around alignment of interest, transparency, governance, and the private fund industry, and really trying to move some of those issues forward. Uh, a, a key component of that is really around fiduciary duties. Um, and the erosion of those in the agreement and LP concern about those, as well as, I would say, the fee and expense reporting. So back in 2016, ILPA released a model fee and expense reporting templates um, and had worked through industry efforts to try and get adoption. And I think the adoption was around 50% of the industry doing that sort of reporting. Um, but there was a feeling that maybe some of the smaller investors might not be able to negotiate to receive that from certain managers. And so... I think the reason the rule came out when it did is obviously political considerations here in DC uh, around getting getting this rule done. There's obviously a large number of rules moving through the SEC, uh, impacting private funds and other areas of capital markets, but also um, thinking about getting those out before something called the Congressional Review Act 
comes into play where Congress can basically disallow certain rules with the majority vote um, within a certain time period around a presidential election. And so that's a number of months away, but um, certainly trying to move those rules through the process to the final stage is, is a motivation. I don't know if Jason wants to jump in. Yeah, I mean, look, my thoughts on this are that there's been, ever since the was able to get private funds registered under the Dodd-Frank Act, there had been, I think, a steady drumbeat by some at the SEC, perhaps some in the LP community to sort of require private fund advisors, you know, A, to disclose more information than they already were to disclose, and B, in some areas, to try to use the SEC's Advisor Act authorities bend or restrict um, market practices that they didn't like for whatever reason. Um, that's sort of a thorny proposition, and I'm sure we'll if the conversation goes forward. But I think, you know, the other overlay that I would say is for about the past 20 years, though, um, private fund advisors generally and private fund investments have been a target of particular left as being something that they either wanted to A, restrict, B, prevent, um, or C, make an example of. So I think, um, you know, there had been, as Chris said, a number of efforts, um, you know, by some in, in the limited partner community and also C, um, to restrict activities in the private funds industry earlier. Um, some of those were, you know, legislative whatnot were defeated. Um, and so I think this is sort of the next logical uh, advancement of that and, um, you know, look forward to just what those implications are for both LPs, GPs, and the SEC as we wade further into the rule. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just jump add a little bit of flavor on what Jason said. I think that's exactly right. So when you think about some of the legislative efforts back in 2019, there was a Elizabeth Warren bill that many folks in the industry on the LP and GP side were concerned about. Um, and it sort of sowed a bit of zeal from progressive side to rein in the private equity industry, given the concerns around how portfolio companies were treated, et cetera. And obviously other private fund advisors were brought along the way. And I'll note that many of the people in the chair's office at the SEC are actually some of those same folks um, who were close to Elizabeth Warren and, and some of the progressive community that now are in a position um, in ex exerting some sort of influence over rulemaking processes at the SEC. And so many of those folks um, come out of the labor community or think tanks connected to, to labor um, and uh, certainly saw an interest in doing something uh, around private equity, private funds within the the rulemaking authority at the SEC, given that some of those legislative efforts really were not going to see traction given sort of the divided Congress that we have. Excellent. And, and this actually comes from the audience, but I think dovetails nicely with what you're discussing. Has there been any consideration of the size of the advisor? So somebody with large versus small assets under management versus those who run SPVs, uh, when they've been considering these rules and kind of how they get formulated? Uh, I mean, I can, I can start oh, and maybe Chris this. jump in. <laughs> I, I would say there's been sort of a It is true, and several commenters pointed out to the SEC that even when you look just at the uh, burdens that are being imposed in the new rule, that those and other uh, requirements that will be uh, placed upon will tend to harm smaller advisors more. Why? Because it's a large burden and they will end up sharing that burden in the larger firms would, and they'll have less uh, resources, arguably, to deal with those issues. So there were some areas um, that where the rule uh, extends timelines for compliance for uh, smaller advisors below 1.5 assets under management threshold. Um, but I, I think, again, you know, um, th there, there are some tremendous on the market and market participants going forward with this new rule. It's a very expansive rule. And I think in, uh, advisors are going to have uh, a challenge dealing with it. Larger advisors will too. It's not that they get any kind of a free, quite the opposite. But I think smaller firms um, and also exempt reporting advisors, i.e. firms that are either venture capital or firms that are not registered with the SEC will face a tremendous amount of new burden under this. And Again, yeah, um, you know, um, I don't see it, but um, but we'll see. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that. I mean, I think uh, having represented smaller advisors uh, in, in sort of my past role, I think certainly that uh, debate happened in Dodd-Frank, right, with the registration thresholds and then, um, you know, that $150 million threshold, but still obviously preserving some state level authority over those below the threshold. Um, and then the exemption for venture advisors that um, really was about divided based on strategy as opposed to size. I think in DC, you actually haven't really seen a division um, where there could be actually some potential success with smaller and, and larger advisors to go in and say, hey, we're smaller, you should treat us differently. We shouldn't be subject to these requirements. But you, you haven't seen that thrust uh, of, I would say, advocacy effort to, to divide based on size. Um, I think most of you know the venture community is off doing their sort of advocacy about their strategy and the venture exemption and preserving that. And then I think, um, you know, uh, private equity advisors are sort of like, look, most of the lo ones over 150 million of any size are registered anyway. Um, I think you have seen a little bit of differentiation probably around the form PF requirements, which have a much higher threshold. Um, but even those obviously were expanded recently for, and, and we can touch on how the, that interacts with some of the rules, but, but they've increased uh, requirements on larger ones through form PF. Got it. And, and yeah. to that and I, point, oh, go ahead, Jason, sorry. Oh, I would just note too, I mean, you're dealing with a lot of the, the hurdles, the exemption hurdles that were put in place in Dodd-Frank. I mean, and they're even smaller now, right? So 150 million in assets under management um, was small. In fact, Chris Dodd, of whom Dodd Frank is named, was was hopeful that he would get a 50 billion or you know a 50 million or 50 you know much 50 billion or 10 billion exemption uh, when he was looking at the Senate package. So you know the 150 million is a small number, and the effect of that is it sweeps into registration a lot of very small private equity firms that really frankly shouldn't have to deal with with the burdens of being registered in, in the way that they have to do currently. Sure, that that makes absolute sense. Um, and 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 to that point, really, there's been this kind of instead of uh, stratification based on assets under management, it really seems like the stratification has been more this exempt reporting advisor, registered investment advisor. Does how do these rules impact kind of those definitions? Are those is that division being eroded? What do you guys see happening there? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on this first. I, I think, look, uh, the exempt reporting advisor framework was obviously statutorily in, incorporated in the Dodd-Frank, right? So it wasn't through rulemaking at the SEC. It was achieved essentially through lobbying by the venture community during Dodd-Frank, where they said, hey, we don't want to be fully registered. Uh, and they were able to achieve that in the legislation. But I think over the years, we've seen this sort of uh, the limits of that venture exemption as maybe venture advisors have gone into the growth equity business or other related businesses that can't fit fully within that exemption. And many of them have decided maybe we should just register. I think this rule is an erosion of the ERA standard, um, mostly around these now restricted activities um, versus prohibited activities that apply to all advisors. And then I think when you think about the calculation of registering and the opportunities for, for further business, lines of business that you might engage in, um, you're, you're sort of balancing that against, oh, you know, maybe I was saving a lot on compliance costs by being in our ERA before, but maybe in the future, I'm not going to. Uh, and maybe that calculation is a different one. Um, and so some of these restricted activities, actually, you could argue have a compliant, higher compliance cost because um, in the proposed rule, these were just outright prohibited, right? So basically, you weren't allowed to do them. So there wasn't maybe as much compliance requirements needed to achieve that beyond just in our agreement, we can't do these things um, to now um, for whatever business impact that might have, which may have been negative, of course, but now restricted. Now you have more papering of disclosure requirements for each of those activities that used to, were just going to be prohibited originally um, and then subject to sort of the whims of the SEC exam staff around hey, is that sufficient disclosure about you doing this activity? And so all that new disclosure and paperwork and compliance requirements are now going to be on ERAs for the first time, uh, including venture advisors. So that is a significant change. And, and I would say an erosion. I don't know, Jason, how you feel about it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think we've started to see, and this is just the latest example of it, an erosion of 
uh, reporting advisor framework that was put in place in Dodd Frank. Um, and I think this is sort of a, a harbinger of things. Would have, one would have expected that since that was a uh, provided exception, that the only way that could really be changed legitimately would be through a subsequent statute, either revoking or amending the advisor framework. So I think, you know, the SEC here is really kind of dangerously walking out on a ledge with sort of a lot of administrative this on exempt reporting advisors, but um, you know that it's 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 a part of the process, and I know we'll talk later about some of the litigation we see may face with the final rule. But I agree with Chris that you know this is yet another example of the era of reporting advisor um, slowly coming to a close. Uh, is 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 sort of how I how I see it, and I think you know it's in the exempt reporting advisor space. A, a very rude awakening to being treated like a registered advisor versus an exempt reporting advisor with a tremendously additional number of reporting burdens and requirements that will be imposed by this rule, the other rules that uh, the SEC will be advancing later on. So I think it's a big change. And again, it's not a congressional change. This is not a change where Congress reached a consensus working with the Biden administration that this should be changed. It's, it's more, um, SEC regulatory preference, and I think that uh, in some ways puts them on a little bit of uh, you know shallow footing uh, when they talk about the ability to do this. Yeah, and um, we had a question come through, uh, a clarification really, does this ruling apply to exempt advisors? I think the key takeaway from the final rule is that there's a bunch of different sub rules within it, and some of them apply to exempt reporting advisors, some of them apply to registered advisors, but um, it kind of, you know, goes through both camps um, and and whatever applies to an ERA almost always applies to the registered uh, investment advisor as well. So um, maybe we could dive a little deeper into the prohibited act or what was the prohibited activities in the proposal, then became restricted activities, aka things you maybe shouldn't do without significant disclosure to your clients. Um, can you go through some examples of what those are and, and maybe how the, the disclosures are, are now going to be implemented or what a, what a fund manager needs to think about? Sure. Uh, Jason, you want to take first crack? <laughs> um, yeah. Prohibited activities rule, there's, there's certain pieces of it that, that remain standing. Um, first and foremost, you to uh, get sort of reimbursed for your, you know, exam and enforcement uh, processes that lead to any kind of a violation of law. Um, that's that's a sort of a prohibition that that remains in place as a staunch prohibition. Most of the other activities um, have been converted into so-called restrictive activities, um, and you know that includes uh, you know a wide um, everything from non pro rata. Uh, expense reporting, uh, non pro rata expense sharing, on uh, you know preferential terms that are being offered to one party, uh, you know can't be offered uh, party without a subsequent disclosure to uh, other parties that could be affected, other potential investors that could be affected. So there's really a sort of a you know kind of a, a whole tranche of things that go from being prohibited per se to now being. Um, uh, prohibited unless there's sufficient disclosure. And I think Chris really hit on a very important point regarding all of this, which disclosure as a tool and a weapon has, has been used before by the SEC to obtain substantive outcomes. And you know, the example that I often look at when I look at this is what happened to accelerated monitoring fees, right? Before registration, uh, in the Dodd-Frank era, accelerated monitoring fees had been, you know, a market term that was available and had been around for a long time. Um, gradually after registration, you started seeing exams and enforcement actions that called into question the appropriateness of accelerated monitoring fees and basically said, well, unless you disclose appropriately, um, you, you can't do these anymore. And then before you knew it, that evolved to a statement that really, um, that, that there was no disclosure that would ever be sufficient in order to meet the burdens required to adequately disclose accelerated monitoring fees. And then, you know, just in this release, I think the SEC had noted sort of glibly fees aren't, you know, they're, they're not allowed under other law uh, now. And so they're not being, you know, addressed here again. So the thing that I would be concerned with 
if I were looking at things that are now allowed with disclosure, um, but weren't uh, you know, previously were prohibited, is that the disclosure may end up over time with exams and enforcement uh, becoming more now appears to be. Um, Chris, I don't know if, if there's if there's sort of more you want to highlight on that point or or anything else on prohibited activity. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I mean, the, the one thing that remains a prohibition is actually something that LPs have been concerned about uh, and, and actually had had a number of conversations with the SEC about where essentially an advisor, you know, had had enforcement actions from the SEC and LPs were picking up their legal costs in their tab for something that they were uh, impacted by. Uh and I think some of the challenges around that was whether there's actually a final judgment, since most of these are settlements. Um, and and you know some LPs, there's a, a prime example that uh, came out in the press where uh, you know an LP had insisted in their policy that they weren't going to accept terms where they were going to reimburse these kind of fees, and they basically lost their allocation uh, to certain GPs. And and I think there was a sort of a feeling like, hey, this LP is trying to do the right thing to insist on good terms. Um, where, look, they shouldn't have to bear the costs of, of a violation, um, but they're essentially losing out on the allocation. And because this kind of came out in the press, the, the LP couldn't change their policies to, to address that. So they missed out on some real positive economic upside from some uh, high profile funds um, for returns for their beneficiaries. And so that was sort of, I think, uh, where the SEC might be coming at that from. And many of these things, I think, Went from an LP perspective, I'll just put my LP hat on. Like, look, LPs weren't crying that uh, they were going to have to eat the taxes in a clawback situation, which is sort of a market term. They weren't out there trying to change that because that's that's just the way the market operates. But I think most LPs were kind of like, look, why should we be paying the tax consequences of you taking a distribution when, um, you know, that's not our fault that you took the distribution. And I think, you know, this ends up in a medium where, at least now LPs will say, look, yeah, we know you had these actual tax implications and you now have to disclose what the actual taxes you did pay rather than the highest hypothetical rates. Um, and so maybe that's a better circumstance. Um, or some of these things around exams, you know, are GPs going to want to come to LPs to say, hey, we had an exam. I want you to pay the cost, right? Uh, now you have to disclose and get consent on some of these items. And the question is, is that a deterrent to actually just say, look, we'll just pay the cost out of the, the management company. Um, and so I, I think, look, it, you know, this is sort of one of the areas that was challenging for the SEC from a litigation risk perspective with the rule. And so their thought is like, um, look, we'll, we'll roll these back to restricted. We'll use the exam authority, um, t- uh, as Jason mentioned on the disclosure side, uh, and we'll have a little more protection um, from potential litigation risk after this rule goes final, um, where those could get knocked down if they were outright prohibited. And, and so I think, I think that's where we see, um, sort of the, the changes here. Um, but that, as we mentioned, it's still going to be a new compliance requirement and burden for ERAs, um, to, to deal with them. Got it. I just one more point, I think on that. Oh, sorry, just real quick clarification before you guys go on. There's a couple of questions about what applies to an ERA versus an RIA. Are these restricted activities rules now applicable to e- both groups or, or just RIAs? They're applicable to both. Um, the provisions that are not uh, ap- applicable to ERAs are the fiduciary, I'm oh, sorry, the fiduciary requirements are removed from the final rule, uh, but um, the fee and expense of performance reporting um, Jason, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I believe only applies to SEC registered advisors, which is a significant reporting requirement um, and will not apply to ERAs. These restricted activities, which were formerly prohibited, will apply to both registered advisors and ERAs. Um, so that's a new requirement for ERAs. But still, some of the elements of this rule are restricted to registered advisors, particularly the fee reporting, the audits, um, and I believe but the preferential treatment requirements. Yeah. Oh, and then the advisor led secondaries will also only be applied to registered advisors. So it's really the restricted activities um, that are new for ERAs, I would say. Yeah, and can I just say on, on one of the restricted activities, um, clawbacks and 
clawbacks with, with the tax reduction. I mean, that was an area that I know was a, of concern to a lot of these. And I think, I think it would be fair to say that certainly where it landed was better than where it started. Um, you know, I still see sort of where it lands ultimately after exams and enforcement, take a further glean on what this rule will be as forward and isn't reversed by a court. Um, in advance. But, um, you know, I, I think that right now that one was, a, I know, a big issue for a lot of GPs. I know there are some who are, you know, breathing a little bit of a sigh of relief that that's still allowed, I think, from a perspective of fairness, that that was, you know, a, a much better and more just outcome than a straight prohibition uh, in that space. But I, again, I expect it to continue to be something that the SEC will focus on in exams and enforcement. And, um, you know, we'll see where it, where it lands as a Got it. And I think both of you mentioned preferential treatment. Uh, and, you know, for a while there, it seems like there was a question of whether or not side letters would kind of die as far as we know them. Um, looks like that's probably not the case with the final rule. Um, although, as you mentioned, it it is only applicable to RIAs. Um, can you kind of go through the impact of the new preferential treatment rule on negotiations between GPs and LPs and uh, you know, how exactly is are, are any market participants going to determine what is considered preferential treatment? Uh, I'll, I'll jump on this first. I, I think, right, when you think about this new preferential treatment rule, it's really three things. So it's uh, preferential redemption rights, um, mostly going to apply in a liquid hedge fund type strategy, um, portfolio disclosure and holdings information, um, also more of a liquid hedge fund strategy. Um, and those were, I, I think, problematic for particular LPs that might be invested in those kind of liquid strategies where, you know, large LPs are maybe getting an early redemption right. Um, and that could could cause material economic impact to the other LPs in the fund. And that's what the SEC was trying to address there. And I think the portfolio holdings information, the question is, are they going to go use that information? Certain LPs that can negotiate that go trade ahead of these in the market or or or, or have some benefit that maybe would have an impact on others in the fund. And I think where LPs were concerned about, particularly public pension LPs, was like, look, our state law requires redemption right. Certain LPs have, uh, you know, you can't invest in Iran companies, you can't invest in it, whatever the state legislature decides is something they want to divest from, depending if it's a red or a blue state. Um, and that could be a variety of things. And so the idea was, okay, we still need this redemption if we're required to by law to really invest in this fund. And I think that's where public pension LPs in particular had a concern about this. Um, that exemption was added for if you need to redeem uh, by law. And then there's also uh, a, a, an element around portfolio holding information or redemption rights um, that was newly added that allows you to do it if you offer it to everybody in the fund. and and. And that's a unique element that makes it workable because you, you can have different share classes. And so different um, share classes can be sort of treated differently as long as everybody in that class are treated the same and that class is open to everyone. You can have sort of a fee reduction or a higher fee. You know, it, there's different variations around fees or charge versus redemption rights and different things. And so you can still structure it through a share class structure. So those are the two main elements. And I think, you know, where some of these public plan LPs may have been concerned about side letters going away and we need the state law protection was really in those. Um, the third element hasn't really fundamentally changed. And that basically is sort of a requirement that side letter terms that provide material economic benefit to LPs have to be shared with all prospective LPs in the fund and current LPs in the fund. And so I think the concern here was a little overblown that these were going to go away. Uh, the side letter process is just awful for everybody, but it's like sort of the best thing we have. Um, the MFN process is a disaster um, and LPs hate it, GPs hate it. But LPs are sort of like, this is the only opportunity we really have to get some of the rights that we need in here or some, some negotiation power. And I think generally my understanding from most LPs is that economic benefits are disclosed in that MFN process anyway. So most of the time you get to see what other LPs are getting and you're aware that, hey, they contributed more, they're a larger LP, they're going to get certain rights. Um, 
smaller LPs like this, so they make sure they're getting a full understanding of the economic benefits that other LPs have and their motivations within the fund or their motivations on the LPAC. This issue was very divisive between large and small LPs. I'll, I'll note uh, that the SEC knew that was going to split the LP community uh, from smaller LPs who maybe like this, larger LPs who maybe felt, hey, I'm getting certain benefits that maybe I won't get anymore. But really, there's nothing that prevents you from getting those rights. It just means you have to share it, the material economic ones with others in the fund. And um, the other element about this that I think is interesting is that you know, where benefits are shared now is often sometimes a, an LP comes in the first close and they get a deal. That's already disclosed in the LPA and everybody knows about it. Um, side letter uh, provisions are already, most people are seeing that in the MFN process about whatever special deal you might have negotiated. What maybe people are not seeing now is sometimes there's these holistic agreements with a particular manager where they're negotiating multiple investments and multiple fund vehicles. And maybe that the fee discounts or other things that are being generated there through this sort of strategic partnership with a particular GP are not being disclosed. And now those will. And that will be interesting to see how that shapes the negotiation process and whether larger LPs are maybe not getting what they wanted. The the SEC's focus here was really this argument and, and feeling in the market that larger LPs, because they weren't able to move the needle on LPA terms that benefited everybody in the fund, were focusing their uh, negotiation power on side letter agreements that just benefited them. So you didn't have sort of rising of all boats with the terms in the LPA. And so these provisions in the preferential treatment rule are the SEC's attempt to really try and level that playing field so that smaller investors benefit from the negotiation power of larger ones. The question is whether that's really going to work. And that's why there's a focus on material economic benefit. Sorry, Jason, that was a long uh, mantra, but yeah. <laughs> good review. I mean, listen. So this is something that applies to all advisors, not just registered advisors. So this is another part of the rule that applies to working advisors as well. Um, you know, I, again, I, I think a little bit. I would say this is sort of another area where this is a solution problem. Um, and I mean, I think the idea is that. You know, they're taking sophisticated parties on both sides, representable, who negotiate for the best terms they can get, um, investing in, you know, a fund and, and then go forward if they're happy and they pivot to another one of the hundreds or thousands of, you know, private funds that are available for their option. That was sort of the rule that be this, this new change. I, I think post this change, I suspect what we're going to end up seeing, and I think Chris to this, some you know, GPs wrestling with this and also some LPs wrestling with this and perhaps some LPs sort of saying, oh boy, it kind of having a little bit of a sorcerer's apprentice, a problem where this, with where this ended up. We'll see. Um, and through that with disclosure to other parties to an agreement, you can still provide, you know, preferential terms um, based you know, requirements. So that's, I think that that will in order to the benefit of, the state pension plan, state pension plans and others were big investors in the private funds world. Um, again, I still sort of think that this is sort of um, the ability of both GPs and LPs, all sophisticated parties, right? I'm talking about any detail and, um, and you're restricting their ability to kind of come up with contracts that make sense to them without imposing a whole set of additional you know, burdens that may as a practical matter Pivot their ability to offer at uh, that that you know, change in term for a particular investor who may need it or may not. So I don't know that it's a it's a it's a great development, but I think we'll we'll have to be watching closely to see how GPs and LPs evolve on this. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll note this was not a reform LPs were seeking, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think it's it's sort of the SEC feeling like, hey, we can fix what we believe are certain imbalances in the market. Um, that's the driver. The question is, yeah, how, how does this shake out in reality? Um, and I think that that sort of was was also a risk with the fiduciary duty rules that were not included here, where it was sort of like, what does this mean? What would this impact? I think fundamentally the whole rule, you ended up with something that eliminated a lot of uncertainties and um, how this will work. 
I mean, you didn't eliminate the compliance and, and paperwork burden and all those requirements, but now it's sort of like, okay, we know how this can work. It's just more cost and, and more compliance requirements. And, you know, the question is, was that cost of compliance from an LP perspective worth it versus what they're getting? Uh, and I think on fee and expense reporting, uh, and I know we haven't touched on this yet, that is an area where this is a massive um, win for, for LPs. Um, and so, you know, getting consistent fee and expense reporting and performance reporting uh, across SEC register managers, I think is really impactful. Sure, and, and I'd like to jump over to that. Before I do, it sounds like from the audience, there's a question about what is the level of detail expected with respect to these side letters slash term disclosures? Um, is it gonna be high level? Do you have to uh, disclose before somebody makes an investment, after somebody makes an investment? Um, did the SEC give us any detail on on what specifics or if you have to name the LP who's getting the deal, any of that sort of thing? Um, you, you do um, have to disclose before you invest um, material economic terms. And then I think the full side letter has to be disclosed. Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, after to current investors. So once you subscribe into the fund. So if you're a prospective investor, you just need to know the material economic terms of others. Um, I'm not sure the name of the LP needs to be disclosed, but I, I, I'd have to double check that. I mean, I think that's right. I mean, right for perspectives, you need to disclose it before they invest, and then you need to disclose it on an annual basis thereafter. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a pretty extensive process. Gone through in negotiating side letters, knows on either the LP or GP side. Every LP has their unique demands, and it actually a function of the market that the market is able to enable LPs to get their boutique issues resolved so they can invest and, and sort of another layer of disclosure burden in that process. My hope is that it won't totally uh, side sidecar uh, sort of the, the side letter uh, agreement process because I think that's actually a very helpful process for LPs, even though everyone knows it's a it's a frustrating negotiation, but it's something that I think brings investors what they need, uh, detail that other investors, frankly, may not care about at all on a boutique you know, issue and enables that investment to go forward. I think that's a and My hope is, is that this rule doesn't end up unintentionally making that, that negotiated process harder to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, now, Chris, I know you talked a little bit briefly about fee and expense disclosure uh, being another kind of big shift in this in the final rule. Um, there are quite a few changes regarding that in the new rule. What impact should or what changes should the GPs and LPs expect in reporting? And do these apply to all investors in a fund, U.S. and non-U.S.? Or is there any distinction that the SEC made there? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump into this. So I think like this is applying to, to SEC registered advisors. Um, it doesn't apply to non-US investors and non-US vehicles with SEC registered advisors or unregistered advisors. So you're not, if you're a non-US LP, you're not necessarily going to get this reporting. But I actually think if you're a, a larger non-US investor and you're in the US investors and funds are getting this, uh, you're going to have a strong ability to probably negotiate for that. And I, I think we'll see the market basically adopt this as a reporting standard since, since those GPs will basically have a process to do it for their U.S. investors. So I would expect it, it wouldn't be a huge additional lift to offer it to all investors. And so I, I think that's the direction of the market. Um, we also have an AFMD2, the European Union uh, element of, uh, similar counterpart to SEC registration, there's going to be a new annual fee reporting requirement there as well. Um, so you're essentially seeing a movement and a global standard for at least um, larger private fund advisors to do this sort of reporting. Um, I think one thing folks didn't really understand about fee reporting, there was sort of this feeling of like, well, these fees that are being charged are, are egregious or bad, or people are flying on private jets and we're upset about that. And, and the reporting requirement is actually not about saying what fees are good or bad, right? It, the fees are what they are, what you've contractually agreed to. And I think LPs and GPs understand that. I think what LPs are basically trying to do is verify that what was charged matches what was contractually agreed. And so this quarterly reporting requirement is an effort to, to track uh, 
where the money flows are moving within the um, within the manager and the fund, as well as in the portfolio companies, right? Where various this is less of an issue in the venture community, but where certain uh, in the private equity community, more fees are being charged at the portfolio company level. And then LPs have negotiated offsets to those fees. And so tracking all that becomes a very complex process, which is why the ILPA fee template was created. And so now you're going to have sort of a quarterly reporting requirement that is likely going to end up standardized in some way. I, I expect there'll be some sort of agreement between GPs and LPs around what that standard model looks like through working through fund administrators and others that are going to generate business from this. Um, and then I think the other big element is performance reporting. And so being required to report IRR and multiple in these funds um, to provide that comparability across funds that, you know, allows, gives the real data from the manager that maybe LPs don't have now to, to calculate that information. And so um, from an LP perspective, you're going to have a lot more information. You're going to pay for that information because GPs will charge that through to the fund. Um, but I think many LPs will see the value of that. Plus, there's an argument that many LPs may have been negotiating for the L ILPA template. And now you've removed a negotiation item from maybe the five things you're asking for uh, out of your request list. And you could replace that maybe with something else. So, so it's hard to quantify what the benefit is there for LPs, but there is a benefit. The one potential downside for LPs is that GPs will say, well, look, you know, you just get this base SEC standard. We're not going to do extra bespoke reporting that certain larger LPs might have been getting. And the question is whether we're going to see a standardization. That was always a challenge with the ILPA template. G a number of GPs endorsed that template because they thought, look, I can create a machine that spits these templates out. Great. I don't have to do all this bespoke reporting. But many uh, larger LPs were like, well, we want the template, plus we want all this other stuff which kind of eroded the benefit of the standard. So the question is whether we're going to see a movement towards a standard. Uh, Jason? Yeah, I mean, I'm skeptical of it. And I'll tell you why I'm skeptical of it, because I think what this really does is it may raise but quarterly reporting. A lot of advisors have done quarterly reporting before this rule um, and, and, will, and will certainly do it after. Um, so I don't think the idea or the concept of a quarterly report to, uh, advi to uh, you know, limited partners is really that form of a concept. Many, you know, certainly for many private equity GPs, that wasn't really a, a foreign idea. I think what's new here is the additional information, the terms, you know, everything that's sort of piled into it. And I think the concern that a lot in the GP community is that rather than uh, forcing standardization, all this is going to force is additional cost to spit out information that some LPs may not care a lick about, right? Some LPs who are investing in a long-held fund with liquid assets early basis about X, Y, or Z issue, but whether they like it or not, they're going to end up getting that. And I think the case is that in addition to having to meet with the quarterly reporting standard, you're also going to continue to have boutique requirements of additional reporting beyond that scope. Um, and I think that would be unfortunate. I mean, you know, listen, I, I think there could be potential to get standardization, um, you know, in reporting. It could be efficient for, for both GPs and LPs. But I'm just skeptical that, you know, um, that sort of every individual LP is going to arrive at that standard. I remember when the when the ILPA largest proponents of you know, the ILPA template said, great, I want the ILPA template, and then I want all the stuff I really want, right? Um, <laughs> He said, oh, well, you know, heavens, um, God, that's something. So I, I, I fear that we might see a little bit of a replicate that where you know, no, no information is good enough. I also want this, that, and the other. And I think at some point that 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 leads, unfortunately, just sort of more burden that, that's, that's frankly unnecessary once you get to a certain level. I'll also add, Jason, and 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 I think you're right. I, I think it, it'll be interesting to see how this sort of shakes out in terms of GPs holding the line on bespoke demands, which sounds like you think is like they're going to cave on this. Um, um, but then the second element is the, the new SEC marketing rule. So there's a new rule that the SEC put out uh, to overhaul their former advertising rule that had been around since the 60s. Um, and that actually came into force just recently. Uh, the rule was final about it, I, I think, a year or two ago. 
Um, and so the interesting thing about this rule was, you know, some of the requirements of the marketing rule um, are sort of connected to the performance reporting requirements in this rule, but the SEC clarified that, no, you still have to comply with all the elements in this rule plus the marketing rule. So um, that is, uh, you know, sort of interesting that there wasn't sort of a, hey, you're doing this under the marketing rule, so you don't need to do it here. The SEC made it pretty clear you have to do both. Um, and so, and like like many things in the private fund space, all of those costs get passed through to LPs in the fund. And the question is, as Jason pointed out, or, is that adding value for you as an LP? Are, are you using that data? Um, do you want that reporting? And you pay for the reporting. And I think for a long time at ILPA, the calculation was, we're willing to pay for the, the data if we can get it. Um, and so that that was sort of the, I think the push here um, around ILPA template adoption. Got it. Yeah, and you guys have both kind of touched on this, but um, the rule has passed, right? The SEC has voted it in. Does that make it final or should we expect market practice, litigation, some combination of no action letters to kind of clarify, like, do we use the ILPA template? Do we use a different template for these other rules? You know, what is what is kind of the the practice that's going to be okay going forward? How do these things get kind of uh, worked out longer term? Maybe I'll let me let me dive in on this, and then and then Chris join in. I mean, I, I think the strands there, and I think they're all important, kind of considering in turn. One is, will there be litigation challenge to this proposal? Um, and I think, I, and I'll I'll walk through in a minute why I think there there could be some serious litigation risk here for the SEC. Um, second and well, you know, will there be no action letters, you know, and or other glean that the SEC will put on these rules? Um, I think I can deal with that by saying the short answer is yes. Over time, the SEC will utilize its exams and enforcement. It may also utilize its AQ powers to, you know, modify or provide additional clarification. Um, some of that clarification will be welcome. Some of that other clarification will be sort of strange and exotic to some. Um, and that's sort of normally what happens, right? Um, and that's sort of a you know a process that we've seen before take place with a lot of SEC rules. Um, to circle back though to the first point, which was the litigation point, I, I think one of the biggest and I, I can say this having been having worked prior uh to my role as capital asset strategies at the American Investment Council, or general counsel and chief operating officer for 12 plus years. Um, I, I think that the SEC has based its authority for the rule on a new statute, a, stat, a part of Dodd-Frank that had never previously been applied to any, and certainly wasn't focused on private fund advisors. So Section 211H1 and H2 is the justification, justification for a lot of the changes in this rule, and many of which are the most controversial parts of the rule. And I think at a time when courts, not just the Supreme Court, but also a lot of circuit courts, are becoming highly, highly skeptical of right, sort of acting sua sponte on their own to make changes that Congress hasn't authorized and using statutes don't directly apply and don't clearly state that it's okay for the regulator to do X, Y, and Z to solve a problem. I think, you know, we're seeing an era where those types of regulatory actions are coming under much greater judicial scrutiny. And I would say that also, you know, we're, and again, we'll see, you know, what happens, but the Supreme Court in a number of recent cases has utilized the major doctrine to basically say, listen, if it's a major question, if it's a major issue, regulator, you need to get clear authority before you go off willy-nilly doing what you wanted to do anyway without any input from Congress. It's just that that isn't how the system works. We have three branches, not four, um, and you have to live within within that power structure. Um, I'd also just note, too, that the Supreme Court may um, be uh, either reversing or altering the contours of Chevron deference, which used to provide for the last century plus a tremendous amount of ability for regulators to uh, interpret vague statutes and their interpretation of vague statutes be the governing one uh, in, under most scenarios. Uh, that That's also a, a, a authority that is, that is um, I think, is set to, to decline or be eliminated or significantly amended by the current Supreme Court. So I think in this environment um, where you have the SEC as a threshold matter lying on um, indirect authority 
and also in a situation where a lot of these proposals, as Chris alluded to, have been considered by Congress and rejected by Congress in the past. I think it does put the SEC out on a real ledge uh, regarding some parts of this rule as to whether or not they have authority. I personally do, but, um, but we'll see how it turns out in the wash. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that. I, I, you know, it's no secret many of the trades on the GP side have announced before the rule that they were all set up for litigation in the Fifth Circuit in Texas, a, a more favorable circuit um, in a conservative state. Um, but, but Jason's right about the direction of the courts around restricting agency power. I think some of the arguments uh, around this story, well, I think it's just groundbreaking to use the fact that the first time ever this authority is being used and it was put in place in 2010 in the statute. And this is the first time the SEC has decided to exercise this authority under Section 913 of Dodd-Frank, this, this Section 211H. Um, and there's been a lot of commentary on it about, well, it was stuffed in a section that kind of covered broker dealers and retail advisors, not really advisors of private funds. So I think it's, it's sort of a, a determination between legislative intent um, hey, was this actually meant to govern advisors, to private funds, or, or, or was it more restricted versus the plain reading of those sections? If you read those sections, it is very clear there's authority. Um, but I think, um, you know, you know, are we going to look at the plain reading of the statute or are we going to look at like who is motivated um, and what did Congress really intend by creating that section and, and how it's stuffed within a broader uh title of the rule that that governs something else and so i think it'll be interesting to see how that plays out um most of the rule uh just just to share it has about an 18 month phase in period depending there's certain level of months but there is a certain phase in period for compliance um and there is some grandfathering provisions in the rule for existing agreements um just just so folks are aware but you know a question is if there is litigation would the court sort of stay implementation of the rule or not. Um, and I, I don't know if that's clear. I don't know, Jason, if you have a view on that. I mean, it's possible really, right? It's up, it's up to the court to determine that. Um, you know, again, I, I, I keep coming back to Congress, you know, doesn't hide elephants in mouse holes on this. And, um, you know, at a time in the Dodd-Frank Act, when they had a whole section, they had a whole title on private fund advisor registration, the fact that 211H and 211H1 and 2 is nowhere to be found in that section, and the fact that it is it is sort of, I think, a plain reading of the text and also a legislative intent reading, I think, would lead you to, to the conclusion that, that this is not authorized. This is, that what's being done here is not authorized by that language. Um, but, you know, we'll see what a court comes up with. And you're right, um, you know, the court could stay the effectiveness of the rule uh, or it could not stay the effectiveness of the rule. And I think, you know, a potential challenge for a lot of GPs going forward and LPs going forward is with a relatively tight timeline to build all of the, um, you know, new disclosure tools and new, uh, you know, setup and structure for your compliance um, if if a rule is subject to litigation and it's stayed, OK, maybe that gives you a little breathing room to, to prepare. Um, if it's not stayed, but the litigation continues, you do risk, I think, the, the very real challenge of you know, putting forward a, a, a boatload of time, energy and capital in getting your fund to be compliant with a rule that then subsequently could be reversed um, down the road. And so that does that's a very practical challenge. And I know firms are taking a very serious look at that going forward, regardless of which way it goes, assuming that there is litigation. Got it. Okay. We're just as a time check, we're in our last five minutes. I'm going to um, turn over to the question and answer section completely. And while I do that, I'm going to put our uh, contact information and, and pictures back up here so everybody can see them. Um, just to clarify from one, one question uh, that came through, it sounds like these rules are the the current funds are grandfathered in, right? So this is not these rules aren't going to apply retroactively to funds uh, that were formed before the rule was passed. Is is that generally true? No, it is generally true. Yeah, that's generally true. It depends on um, the the parts that that receive the grandfathering, but that's generally true as long as the operating fund agreements. Um, you know, would require an amendment for those sorts of changes, right? So generally that's true on the restricted activities and um, and preferential treatment parts of the rule. Um, on other parts, uh, it's, it's, it really isn't 
uh, you know, a lot of additional grandfathering provided. And even that grandfathering, although I think it will be helpful for the many funds that are in current operation, I, I, I view the, the language that they've put in there and the qualifiers that the SEC has put in there as, as being somewhat curtailing. I mean, it's not exactly broad um, grandfathering that some had talked about or hoped for or sort of a of a plain, you know, for lack of a better phrase, sort of like a plain Jane grandfathering. It's it's um it's different than that. So I think people need to take a look at that. And I and I think it actually the compliance date was when the rule was released. So like if you're signing an agreement now, I, I, I don't think you have grandfathering protection over those 18 months, right? Jason, that's my understanding. But I think it's once it goes into effect, Chris, but but the other oh. thing is is that even if you had an agreement was effective before uh, the the compliance date. If you if you didn't actually begin the activity of the fund, then you might not get access to the grandfathering. So in other words, if you had an agreement in place um, before, then you might not get access to the grandfathering. So I think the grandfathering is. I mean, it's certainly helpful in certain circumstances. It's better that it's put in here and not taken out of it. But it's not a um, an elixir for everybody, and folks should focus very closely on the details of that provision. Got it. So some grandfathering, we need to pay attention to that. And then there will be that kind of phase in period over, I think, I think 18 months was the term I heard there um, for some of those uh, rules, right? That people will be able to uh, comply with them. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of different, so there's staggered compliance on a number of different parts of this rule, right? There's a part of this rule that goes into effect 60 days after publication in the register. And that's, um, you know, documenting annually or compliance review, right? So that happened. And that's not just for advisors to private funds. That's also for advisors, investment advisors who aren't to private funds. And I think the, the, the reason for that was the SEC wanted to see those things in paper when they when they come and do their exams and, and start enforcement actions. So, you know, that part of it goes into effect right away. Uh, for the fee and expense reporting, that's an 18-month phase in um, for prohibited activities and um, preferential treatment, it's staggered because it's 18 months for smaller firms. I think it's advisors under 1.5 billion in AUM. And then, so for them, it's a longer period and it's a 12 month period for advisors with AUM greater than the 1.5 billion. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of staggering involved um, in, the, in the different parts of this rule and, and, and what it applies to. Um, so and same thing with advisor led secondaries and others. So I think it's important again to recognize both the different areas of compliance, where your firm fits in, um, and you know what you need to do uh, going forward on in what order. Excellent. Okay. Well, that was perfect because we're right at time. So um, thank you guys so much for, for taking the time to speak to us. I know there's some more questions in the Q&A section. Uh, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to those. All of our email addresses are here. So if you would like to reach out and ask specific questions, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for attending today.